Hi, my name is Jen Balava. I'm a naturalist with Burlington County Park System. Today I'm going to share all kinds of fascinating plant adaptations that we have throughout the, the parks that you can see at different times of the year. I'm going to start with some very special spring wildflowers. So these wildflowers that we're going to be looking at are called spring ephemerals. An ephemeral just means that it's very short-lived or fleeting. These spring wildflowers have very specific adaptations that in order to live in a situation where the trees are leafing out now in the spring and they're going to be blocking out their sunlight. So these wildflowers that, that bloom underneath the trees of the forest have to pretty much do everything that they need to do in only a couple weeks before all of their sunlight is blocked out by the trees above them. So these particular wildflowers are known as spring ephemerals because they're only above ground for just a couple weeks. That means they have to come up, they have to flower, they have to get pollinated, and then they have to set seed all in a very short amount of time. And then after those few weeks are over, the entire plant will disappear from above ground, existing only in underground portions the rest of the year. So while they are up for this short amount of time in the spring, they're getting energy from the sun through photosynthesis, and the energy that they get from photosynthesis is stored in those underground portions of the plant, mostly rhizomes and tubers, which are like little potatoes. So we're going to take a look at a few examples of true spring ephemerals that bloom here at Smithville Park. So the first plant we're going to look at is called trout lily. And trout lily is named for the mottled appearance of the leaves that resemble trout. You'll see that they have a lot of single leaves coming out of the ground. And these single leaves are just part of that overall underground system. They'll never have a flower. It's just leaves to support the whole system. These are all connected. And then where you have leaves, there, there's two together. That's the only place where you have a flower that emerges between those two leaves. In this case, the trout lily has yellow petals that nod. And one of the fascinating adaptations of spring ephemerals is that they close on cloudy days, cold days, and also every night. And why would that be? Well, the answer is because it's there, if, there, if your flower is only out for two weeks, you can't afford to lose any precious stores of pollen. So if there's any sign of rain, if it's cloudy, the, le the flowers will close up. If it's too cold for insects to be flying around, like right now, the flowers close up. And of course, at night, the insects they need are not flying, so they close up again. So that's all so that they absolutely make sure that they don't lose any pollen unnecessarily. So that's one really fascinating thing. In addition to having all those really interesting adaptations, trout lily also has the added benefit in being able to absorb excess amounts of phosphorus. And that's really important when it grows near a water body like a creek or a river. So if the leaves are near the edge of a, of a river bank, they'll intercept excess amounts of phosphorus and prevent them from going into the water, which is really important. We don't want excess nutrients in the water. The, the spring ephemerals are also all very pastel colors, white, yellow, or very pale pink. And the reason for that is because all of these plants are blooming early in the season when there's not many insects out at this time. And because of that, they must ensure that what insects are here are absolutely able to see them. And since not all insects have color vision, the, all the insects that are out at this time of year can definitely detect a pale colored flower against a dark background. And that's why all spring ephemeral wildflowers are these pale colors like white or yellow. Pretty fascinating. This all has to do with the pollinators they attract at this time of year. And if you 
If you're observant and you look in the fall when there's also less insects, the same thing happens again. You have a lot of white and yellow wildflowers and none of the other colors because there's less insects around to pollinate them. So that's one of the other fascinating adaptations. The other is that you can see that these grow very close to the ground. They don't get any higher than a couple inches off the ground. And that's to stay out of the weather and the wind. So they're protected, growing close to the ground. And one of the other things that we'll note is that a lot of them have some kind of cup-shaped appearance in their petals so that it, it directs the sunlight and the pollinators directly to where they need to go. So this is spring beauty. It's one of our true spring ephemerals. You notice this one has very narrow grass-like leaves and very pale whitish petals that turn a pinkish color as they age. So spring beauty is a really fascinating plant. If you look closely at the petals, you'll see there's five white petals with very faint pink lines on those petals. And those pink lines are like runways that direct the pollinator's eyes directly to the center of the flower where they need to go. And as the spring beauty ages over the short amount of time that the flower is open, you'll start to see that the color of the petals will start to change from white to a darker pink. And that indicates to the pollinators that pollination is complete there to go somewhere else. So there's different uh, colors and signals that we can see happening between these wildflowers and the pollinators. Spring Beauty itself is also one of the most successful spring ephemerals, having been documented to have 71 different species of insects pollinating it. So it, if you think about it, it's one of the most important sources for our native pollinators as far as a source of, of nectar and pollen. Here we have another example of a true spring ephemeral wildflower. It's called wood anemone and it only blooms for a very short period of time in April. You can see that it has five white petals and interesting leaves. There's five leaflets per, per leaf and they form sort of a colony where all of the leaves are interconnected underground with those rhizomes. That's where they're storing all that energy that they get in this short per period of time from the sun. Another interesting thing to see on these wood anemone is that the white petals are kind of cup shaped and they're facing directly into the rays of the morning sun. So they're maximizing their chance of getting pollinated and also maximizing the chance of the leaves uh, being able to be more efficient at getting energy from the sun. Jack in the Pulpit is a fascinating native spring wildflower that comes up and it'll be around for the whole summer. This particular plant has three leaves and a very strange structure that kind of looks like a leaf but it's not. It's a weird thing that looks green and curved over like this little hooded structure. It's called the spathe, S-P-A-T-H-E. And inside that hooded spathe is, a, is another structure and at the bottom of this tube, there'll be a small ring of flowers. The amazing thing here is that this is a young male Jack in the Pulpit flower. It's going to have a small ring of white flowers at the bottom of this tube. These emerge before the female plants. The idea is to attract the pollinator to fly over. They like these neat purple stripes that develop and then when they fly in, they get stuck and they fall down into the tube. At the bottom, they have to brush up against that ring of flowers and the pollen lands on the insect's back. And if you look really closely at the bottom of this male jack in the pulpit, there's a little tiny exit hole. So the insects fly in, they get covered in pollen at the bottom and then they fly out the exit hole. A few days later, hopefully, the female jack in the pulpit has emerged. This is a much larger plant with a much thicker stem. And 
if those same insects that were carrying the pollen from the male plant go into the flower tube of the female, they'll go in and they'll pollinate the flowers at the bottom of that tube, which is the strategy of this particular plant. But the, the really crazy thing is that the female jack in the pulpit does not have an exit hole. And that means that the insects get trapped at the bottom of that tube, which is a pretty mean thing for, uh, for the plants to essentially murder their pollinators. There is a lot of speculation as to whether the plant is able to use the insect bodies to its advantage, and we're pretty sure it does in some way, but it is not a carnivorous plant like a pitcher plant that you would find in the pinelands that actually digests insects. This is not that, but it still has one of the most incredible adaptations in the plant kingdom, certainly here in, in New Jersey. For comparison, this is a female jack in the pulpit that's just emerging. So the spade isn't up yet, but you can see that it's twice as thick on the stem as the male, and it has two branches that hold three leaves instead of just one. So it's a much larger, more robust plant. Here we have a much more mature jack in the pulpit. This is a male plant. You can see the amazing purple streaks and that contrasting pattern that attracts pollinators to go into this tube where the ring of flowers is at the bottom. We're here at Smith's Woods, and we're going to take a look at one of the most fascinating plants in the wetland areas here called skunk cabbage. It's a really strange plant, and you'll find it right at the bottom of the steps here in the wetland area. This is the very first plant in North America to flower. It comes up in March, early March, and it doesn't look like a typical flower. It has a very strange maroon color and a hooded structure and it's mimicking the color and scent of rotting meat of an animal that didn't make it through the winter. These flowers have the ability to melt snow by generating their own heat and in doing so really mimic some, uh, some kind of warm-blooded animal. And the, at that time of the year, there are carrion flies that are looking for animals that didn't make it through the winter and looking for a place to lay their eggs. And they get tricked by the skunk cabbage flower. It looks and smells like the right thing and they fly into that strange looking structure, get covered in pollen and in the process pollinate the skunk cabbage. So it's a very unusual pollination strategy. And if you come to this area of Smithville in March, you may see these very strange maroon flowers. Once the flower has been pollinated, the flower completely dies back and these very large leaves start to emerge. At that time, there's no more uh, nasty smell. And the rest of the year, we see skunk cabbage as these giant, huge, lush green leaves in the wetland areas, very well defined the wetland section, in fact, when you look in the woods here. And what's so amazing is that these giant leaves are perfect. It looks like a salad bar for all of the animals here to eat. But if you look closely, you'll notice the leaves are perfect. Nothing's been eating them, and there's a very good reason for that. So this particular family of plants, known as the Arum family, A-R-U-M, includes the skunk cabbage and the jack on the pulpit. And these plants have crystals inside the leaves that is the equivalent of an animal eating glass. It would tear an herbivore's throat and tongue to shreds if it tried to eat these leaves. It's a fantastic defense against herbivores like deer and rabbits and squirrels. The only things that could possibly take a little bite out of this are some insects, but they certainly wouldn't be able to eat much of the leaf. So if you do see holes, they're going to be very tiny from, from insects. So it's a, an ama they have incredible adaptations for pollination and then incredible adaptations for deterring herbivores. 
And if all goes well, towards the end of the season, there'll be very strange fruiting structure in late summer, which is sort of a green, bumpy thing that arrives when the leaves are starting to die back. So there's always something interesting to see here in the wetlands at Smith's Woods throughout the year. This is a very common tree that's called sweet gum. You could find it in almost every county park in Burlington. Sweet gum has a very interesting adaptation to prevent deer from browsing the young twigs, which are very tasty. So on native, naturally growing sweet gums, not those that are planted, but ones that are growing in the wild, you'll notice the, 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 the lower branches of sweet gum have these interesting corky ridges all along their young twigs. And this is a great deterrence from deer or any other animals that might be able to reach the young, low branches of sweet gum. So this is, this, all these strange things you see here are preventing uh, deer from eating them. They don't get these ridges at the top of the tree where the animals can't reach. Sweet gum is wind pollinated. And the way to tell if a tree is wind pollinated or not is to look at the kind of flowers it has. The trees that are wind pollinated are going to have very inconspicuous green flowers like the sweet gum. And we also see that on oaks and beaches and birches. These flowers are blending in with the new leaves and they will emerge before the leaves have fully opened because if the leaves were fully opened, it would block the movement of air around the flowers, which make, should make it harder for the wind pollinated pollen to disperse. So this is just another adaptation that this particular tree has.